Next, we're going to look at plasticity and functional recovery. So you need to be aware of plasticity and functional recovery of the brain after trauma. If we look at plasticity first, the brain has the ability to change throughout life. During infancy, the brain experiences a rapid growth in the number of synaptic connections it has. As we age, rarely used connections are deleted and frequently used connections are strengthened. This is known as synaptic pruning. This enables lifelong plasticity where new neural connections are formed in response to new demands on the brain. And we have two pieces of research. So you've got your London taxi driver study and then a study about medical students. Maguire et al. studied the brains of London taxi drivers and found significantly more volume of grey matter in the posterior hippocampus than in, matched, in a matched control group. This part of the brain is associated with the development of spatial and navigational skills in humans and other animals. As part of their training, London cabbies must take a complex test called the knowledge, which assesses their recall of the city streets and possible routes. Maguire et al. found that this learning experience alters the structure of the taxi driver's brains. They also found that the longer the taxi drivers had been in the job, the more pronounced was the structural difference. So they noticed a positive correlation between taxi drivers who took the knowledge and taxi drivers who had been working for a very long time and the changes in their hippocampus. Draginski et al. imaged the brains of medical students three months before and after their final exams. They found learning induced changes again within the hippocampus and the parietal cortex and they presume that these are the results of learning. So they have found a correlation between the learning experiences and changes within the brain. Both of these studies support the idea of plasticity. Next, we have functional recovery. So functional recovery is an example of plasticity in action. Following physical injury or other forms of trauma, such as the experience of a stroke, Unaffected areas of the brain are often able to adapt and compensate for those areas that are damaged. Functional recovery after trauma is an example of plasticity. Healthy brain areas may take over the functions of those areas that are damaged, destroyed or even missing. This process can occur quickly after trauma, known as spontaneous recovery and then slow down after several weeks or months. At this point, the individual may require rehabilitative therapy to further their recovery. And within the evaluation, we'll look at an example of rehabilitative therapy. The brain is able to rewire and reorganize itself by forming new synaptic connections close to the area of damage. Secondary neural pathways that would not typically be used to carry out certain functions are activated or unmasked to enable functioning to continue. Now we have three key words here and I apologise for my pronunciation of these words. Axonal sprouting, the growth of new nerve endings which connect with other undamaged nerve cells to form new neuronal or neural <laughs> pathways. Denervation supersensitivity. When axons that do a similar job become aroused to a higher level to compensate for the ones that are lost. However, it can lead to oversensitivity to messages such as pain. Recruitment of homogulous or similar neurons on the opposite side of the brain. This means that specific tasks can still be performed. An example would be if Broca's area was damaged on the left side of the brain, the right-sided equivalent area would carry out its functions. After a period of time, functionality may then shift back to the left side. 
So these three key terms are examples of how functional recovery works, how our brain is able to functionally recover from trauma. And on your worksheet, there is a list of keywords. So make sure you can define these keywords and explain them. Now we have some evaluation points. I've got two for plasticity and two for functional recovery. So this, these first two are for plasticity. Plasticity may have negative behavioural consequences. For example, 60 to 80% of amputees have been known to develop phantom limb syndrome. This is the continued experience of sensations in the missing limb as if it were still there. These sensations are usually unpleasant, painful and are thought to be due to cortical reorganisation in the somatosensory cortex that occurs as a result to limb loss. This suggests that the brain's ability to adapt to damage is not always beneficial. So with regards to phantom limb, it's an example of a negative consequence of functional recovery. Strength of plasticity. Brain plasticity may be lifelong. Bazola et al. demonstrated how 40 hours of golf training produced changes in the neural representations of movement in participants aged 40 to 60. Using fMRI, the researchers observed increased motor cortex activity in the novice golfers compared to a control group suggesting more efficient neural representations after training. This shows that neuroplasticity can continue throughout the lifespan. So this is really important, especially if we're looking at an aging generation. It's this idea that we can help individuals improve their abilities. People can still learn new things, even at an older age. So they should be getting involved in activities to stimulate their brain and keep these connections being made and to keep the connections being strengthened to improve an individual's brain health. Now we have two limit, two limited, sorry. We have one strength and one limitation for functional recovery. Strength, real world application. So this is about the rehabilitative therapy. Understanding the process involved in plasticity has contributed to neuro rehabilitation. So this links to functional recovery, but again, it also links to plasticity. For example, constraint induced movement therapy is used with stroke patients, whereby they repeatedly practice using the affected part of their body. So, for example, if an individual has damage to the right motor cortex, then this will mean that they have damage to, for example, their left arm. Within this therapy, what they would do is they would get an individual to use their left arm while their right arm, which is unaffected, is restrained. So they're practicing using the affected part of their body that which is linked to the damaged part of their brain. And while they do this therapy, it helps to stimulate these neurons and it helps with the recovery. So this shows that research into functional recovery is useful as it helps medical professionals know when interventions need to be made Limitation. Level of education may influence recovery rates. Researchers found that the more time people with a brain injury had spent in education, the greater their chances of disability-free recovery. 40% of those who achieved disability-free recovery had more than 16 years education compared to about 10% of those who had less than 12 years in education. This would imply that people with brain damage who have insufficient disability free recovery are less likely to achieve a full recovery. So basically, 
this limitation at the bottom is saying that it's also affected by other things and it's affected by these external factors or these confounding variables such as level of ed education and that could be due to the organisation of our brain, the learning experiences that we have. So it just shows that this idea of functional recovery is actually far more complex and it could be something that's linked to our upbringing and the connections that are made throughout our lifetime within our brain. So it's something that needs to be investigated further so we understand how we can help everybody with regards to their recovery. Okay, so we've had a look at plasticity and functional recovery. Have a look at those exam questions. Have a look at some of the longer exam questions on past papers as well. Maybe plan a few ex extended answer questions using mark schemes. Have a look at the application questions. And remember, functional recovery is an example of plasticity in action. So functional recovery supports the idea of plasticity. And without the idea of plasticity, functional recovery would not be possible. So these two link with one another.